What the happiest retirees know that you don't. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Yeah, Brian, I am super excited about this because we know that one of the principles we always talk about is to begin with the end in mind. And so me, you know, being a younger person, not at retirement now, I'm so excited about talking about what happy retirees know so that I can kind of, you know, archive that away in my knowledge bank to, okay, these are the things I ought to be thinking about, ought to be moving towards, ought to be looking at if I really want to begin with a happy retirement as my end goal in mind today. Uh, we felt like since this was such a, had some heavy lifting, had some implications, mm-hmm. we need to bring in some reinforcements sure. on this. So Big guns. We, we actually have our friend Wes Moss here. And if you're from Atlanta, you know who Wes is. But um, just for, for those who are brand new to, to Wes Moss, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little intro. Now, um, I, I'm, Wes, give me a little grace. I'm veering from your, your official bio, <laughs> but you know, a lot of you might recognize Wes from Retire Sooner mm-hmm. podcasts, but Wes is also, he's a, a fee-only financial advisor mm-hmm. like us, has a, a large firm in Atlanta. And then what um, I like about Wes is he's so generous. I mean, whenever I've gone through business decisions and other things since CIA, his firm is a, you know, a little ahead of us on some of the times they've had to make decisions. Wes has always been generous, but then he's also had some successful books that he's written. Mm-hmm. And that's what, kind of why we wanted to bring him on is because he does have a brand new book out called ha- Happiest Retirees Know. And, and I like this because this is going to allow you to internalize what are the people who are doing it right know and how can you kind of start emulating and practicing these behaviors in your own life. So Wes, man, how are you doing today? Everything good in your world? Bo, I'm great. And uh, Bo and Brian, it's, uh, you know, look, we, we've always been on a, a, a similar parallel track where we've, you know, I, I really have a lot of respect for you guys, both in all of the media that you guys do and the practice that you guys have and run your financial, uh, the business of financial advice and investment practice. And uh, so it, it feels as though it, we, I've gotten a lot of great advice from you guys over the years as well. So I, I appreciate that. And thanks for uh, thanks for having me on the show. We've always had a great time. Well, I, I kind of want to jump into some of this because, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's pretty interesting stuff. It, um, uh, to, to write a book, I know, is no... It's not an easy, easy task. Enough. I mean, right? it's just a, it's a hard task. It's on a lot of people's bucket list, and you've not you're one of those people. You didn't write just one. You've written multiple. So, what kind of got you into wanting to be an author, but also go beyond what got you into this specific subject matter we're going to cover today on being happy in retirement? So, you know, I I don't I don't know. Uh, I did. I don't know what started this. But I can just tell you that uh, it is a it is a brutal experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that if you're just writing a book, maybe it would be it wouldn't be as as long of a slog. But w- my life is a lot like you guys. I have four little kids. I've got a, a business, Capital Investment Advisors, and then uh, a radio and a podcast, a radio show and a podcast. So it's it's really doing that almost in your spare time yeah. and it just takes what's up spa- a lot what's of spare time, time? <laughs> what is spare time i don't know the thing you're talking about <laughs> and and the other thing is the, the, the you can you can crank out a book if you really want to you can hire a bunch of people crank out a book in a couple months and, and people do that all the time i think but it's also in, in my opinion in order to do it that way you might as well not even do it don't spend the money don't spend the time because it's not going to be it's not going to be any good and it's not going to really help anybody. And it's just a, it's, it might as well just be a fancy, expensive business card. If you're going to write a book and spend the time to do it, it's got to be something that you have extraordinary passion about, you believe in, and it's got to be something unique that can really, that, that's different and that can help people. Mm-hmm. And I think that part of why th- th- this is, I hopefully I don't, ha- I don't write another book. I don't know, ever, uh, because <laughs> it takes so long to do these things to do them right. I mean, you can retire sooner than you think, probably took you know, the better part of two years to sure. do. And then then what the happiest retirees know, which just came out, maybe is the is almost the culmination of 10 years of, of research and writing and articles. And you think, oh, I've written 200 articles. I write for the Atlanta, AJC, Atlanta Journal of Constitution here in Atlanta. And you think... Well, I've written all these articles. Can't we just string them together? No, it's not the way it works. <laughs> not at all. Uh, so, 
and then I and then I had this thought of I'm just going to re- kind of re-update you can retire sooner than you think and I did that and I was like I spent months on that and it just wasn't that good. It was just a rehash of an old book. So then I went back to the drawing board and just said what is a what is what is brand new? What is so important to in my brain that I want to share? And that is this concept of trying to find, t- trying to solve a problem or reverse engineer something that we want to emulate. Like yeah, you guys, yeah, yeah. Bo, you said, or Brian, you said, we, we here on the show, we want to begin with the end in mind. Yep. Mm-hmm. I think of it the same way as I want to reverse engineer with data, with data, a problem. And a problem in America is how do I get to retirement in, and have it be a really high quality retirement, a happy retirement. So pretty simply, what do you do? You go find the happy retirees mm-hmm. and you study them and yeah. you juxtaposition them against or compare them with the unhappy retirees. And that has been this project I've been on for really a decade. But as you can imagine, there's all these categories. You got to get thousands of people that requires massive amount of data. And then you got to separate out the two groups. Oh, here are the happy, is the, I call them h Robs in the book, mm-hmm. Happiest Retirees in the Block. And the you, Rob's unhappiest retirees mm-hmm. on the block. And then let's compare the data between those two so we can re- reverse engineer. Let's do what these guys do and don't do what they do. And it just takes a lot of time. But it ultimately, it does w- once it's done, like this is the fun part to share the message. The book's done. I don't have to write one of these things for a long time because I, I would say that I don't love, I-, I haven't loved writing the book, but I love having written the book. Yeah. 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 Yes. So we have a lot of our audience are. I mean, because we, I'm sure you follow the the demographics of your of your audience as well. We've got a lot of folks that are in that mid 20s all the way up to to really 20 to 40s mm-hmm. is our key demo. Um, so they're not in retirement, but they're obviously looking towards retirement. That's why they're they're taking a little bit today for that great big beautiful tomorrow. What are what are some of the key things? Um, that that you think are really teachable, especially for somebody who kind of sits on our shoes, where not only do we build our own wealth, but we help people manage their wealth. That that, that kind of gives you a different viewpoint than I think the average person writing these types of books. So I think that this is one thing that is a challenge for the the title of my book, which is "What the Happiest Retirees Know." 10, 10 habits for a healthy, secure, joyful life. I think it it, sp- it it immediately says, oh, this is for people in their 50s and 60s. For older folks, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's really, and it's not. It, yeah. it, it really is a book for people that are, that are at least starting to think about retirement. And I think in America, we start thinking about that really early. Mm-hmm. We, th- we start thinking about financial independence in our 20s, right? Yeah. We've got the FIRE movement. Financial independence, retire early, that starts in your 20s, and then it starts to ramp up in your 30s when you start having kids and buying houses, mm-hmm. and ha- and really you know you should be putting money in your 401k. So it's as much as it seems like it would be a book for somebody who's 60, it's really even better for someone who is in their 30s and their 40s that can start knowing what, well, I, I want to do what they did, right? Mm-hmm. I-, I know that, and if you have time, if you're 40, or 35, and you know, in general, what are these best practices? What are the habits of the happy group? You can start to implement them today, and it's a heck of a lot easier to start it now and have a runway to get to financial independence, get a solid foundation, to understand the not just the nice to have, but the requirement mm-hmm. of the social side of getting into a happy retirement. I mean, just a requ- it's, a, it's a not a maybe. It's not a nice to have. It's an t- absolute critical piece of the equation. So just understanding that now. Um, and then having this long list of core pursuits that again, these are, I call these hobbies on steroids. Ho- core pursuits are not something you start when you're 65 mm-hmm. yeah. or 60 and retire. You start when you're 25, you start when you're 30. And, and I think that's why it's so important for pe- for younger folks that care about full financial independence and living in and, and entering some sort of happy retirement to start thinking about it today. So what, what does it like when you describe a happy retirement, like you've talked to all these people, you've interviewed all these people trying to figure what, what does a happy retirement look like? Does that just mean like that's someone who's got enough money in the bank where they're wealthy? You know, they've just mm-hmm. got a big, you know, fat account balance and that's the thing that makes them happy. What is an actual happy retirement? 
Yeah, it's, so it's a comedy. It's, I think of it as like an old family recipe that gets passed down generation to generation. You've got, and in the, in the, in the book, I share 30 different habits, if you will. Mm -hmm. And essentially, you've, you've got 30 things that the happy group does and 30 things the unhappy group gets wrong. Mm -hmm. So it, it really is a long list of ingredients in this, in this old family recipe that's going to be different for everybody. And not everybody nails all 30 ingredients. Sure. You can really make this list of ingredients your own. But if you, if you think about the core components, first, the, the, fa the fundamental foundation is just understanding the financial piece. Mm -hmm. So we want to have some, and that's a little more black and white. We've got to get to certain financial checkpoints for liquid retirement savings. Mm -hmm. Happy retirees have at least, and again, I get blowback on both sides on this one, at least a half a million dollars in liquid retirement assets. Okay. Uh, they also are getting, and, and again, it's okay if we have more, right? I, I get something. <laughs> how can you say, I can never get to 500,000. You're crazy. You get the and same blowback we that are, get. Yeah. <laughs> And, and then, and Brian, I'll get uh, five hundred thousand. What do you, who are you, you? That's an irresponsibly low number, Wes. Yeah. Susie, Susie Ormond says yeah. you need fifteen million. Yep, yep, that sounds about right. Sounds about right. I always so they, remind see, people you don't get to three million or five million without the first million. But yeah. you, you bring up even a greater point. Five hundred thousand is a tremendous critical mass mm -hmm. point because then your money starts earning enough that it can replace your your labor. Yep, that's right. I mean, it is kind of, a, and it's also an inspiring point when you when I talk to people my age who are in their forties when their money can make enough in like the last month, two month, or the quarter that replaced a month of their their wages. They sit up in their seat and they go, "Holy oh, that's cow! Pretty awesome. This, this is we are starting that. to see where this is all kind of culminated into mm -hmm. something pretty pretty incredible." Yeah. Oh, this is what it was supposed to do. And 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 guys, you're exactly right. There's a the the, the five hundred thousand came from again lots of let's call it the first the first survey I did was around thirteen fourteen hundred families. The second one I did was about two thousand or close to two thousand. And that ended up being the median checkpoint number, by the way. So it's a little bit different if you look at the mean or the average, but the median number where people crossed over from the unhappy to the happy camp, that was where I got to that five hundred thousand dollar number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and there and and again, that that came from just the research and the data. But if you look at it and start to try to explain it, exactly what you were just saying, Brian, is that. It also means that if you start thinking about what can you pull from that, that's about two two grand a month forever, mm -hmm. and two grand a month plus Social Security might be two to three grand a month. Now you're five grand a month, so it start and then all of a sudden, which leads me to the next big financial point here, which is ha pay off have no mortgage. Yeah. And oh, yeah. again, this yeah, came free. from data as well, which was ha uh, retirees who are within five years of paying off their mortgage are four x four times more likely to end up in the happy camp. Hmm. Start you start weaving all those doable, let's say, checkpoints together, and now you no mortgage, low expenses, five six grand a month. Well, wait a minute, you can start to live in America and be able to live a, a, a pretty free a life of economic freedom when we start to hit those numbers. So that's that's the financial side of the equation. The the, the next piece of this would be trying to continue your 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 life's purpose, which goes back to these, what I call core pursuits. Those mm -hmm. are these three, you have to have the happy, happy retirees have 3.6 core pursuits or hobbies on steroids. Yeah. Unhappy group has less than two mm -hmm. on average critical piece of the equation. And then, uh, I, I would say if I had to choose another fundamental piece out of all, all 10 chapters, which are the core habits in what the happiest retirees know, it would be the, the social connectedness piece. Yeah. So we've got our money. We understand our, our how do we replace our the dignity of our work because we mm -hmm. love we love to work in America. We take pride in like it, this yeah. is what we do. This is what we do in Tennessee. This is what we do in Atlanta, Georgia. This is what we do in Texas. We mm -hmm. work as yeah. Americans, right? Yeah. So the third piece, though, and it's easy for hardworking guys like Brian and Bo to always work. You got a lot. You got a lot. Of, you got a lot to do, right? You've got a firm. Sure. You've got a, a, a massive YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. You've got a massive podcast. Uh, you could work twenty four seven. Sure. But the social side of the equation, which is having at least one social epicenter, uh, is it is an it, it is a piece that you cannot 
dismiss. It is the it is perhaps the <clears throat> one of the fundamental legs of the stool for the happy retiree. But I, I, I do want to ask a question on this because when I was going through the book, I felt a little convicted about this this section on three hobbies and I was like, well maybe if I count the podcast is one, the YouTube is one, the fir- running a firm with just employees his, is three. His, maybe these count his as hobbies. His hobbies on steroids. One, and Wes, you you kind of were self confessional as well that you struggle. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. our clients especially struggle with this. What do you tell somebody who is, because I, I, I tell people constantly, look, I help people build retirement, mm-hmm. but I'm having so much fun. Like mm-hmm. so, after I'm on vacation for a week, I'm trying to figure out how I can get back in here and create content sure. and, and talk to our, 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 you know, the Money Guy family. Um, what does it say for people like us where part of being purposeful, because I know that's part of happiness and fulfillment, but this is what we is. Is that a conviction or is that actually? I, I don't know. That was is the only that thing, okay? Are you, yeah, that's something that I was struggling on with as I was reading that, okay? that. As I was like, man, I don't play tennis and I play golf like twice a year, you know. So I, I, I don't know. I, I worried about that a little bit as I was reading that section. So so a th- so Brian, a thousand percent yes, because but but it's a it's a ra- it's it's somewhat rare for you to be in the position you're in when it comes to how you feel about work, right? right? The I would say that in in a long list of core pursuits, which I I, I even have a core pursuit finder calculator. It's a it's a almost I have an online tool about how to help people find core pursuits. I love it. One of <laughs> I them need to go to that website. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Notice I didn't give my website. <laughs> I don't want anybody to know the website. <laughs> M- Mallory over here is like, come on. No, I'm not going to say um, Because, the, so, so a co- particularly in this area where I call retirement gray zone, as, as, as we all know, the, the black and white retirement of working full-time, then retired full-time, that's not how it usually works, mm-hmm. or it doesn't always work that way. Very often people scale down. And they go into this kind of retirement gray zone, or I see, particularly for really early retirees, sure. they may just scale back. They've got enough saved. They don't need to save anymore. They can go do a job that they like. But the reason I say that you're in kind of a rare position, but if you're in this position, I think work and podcasts, all of those things count as core pursuits, is that only about one in five Americans are fully engaged and love their work. Yeah. That's that's yeah. that's that's why it's a little yeah, rare. For sure. Four out of five, so 80% of Americans are either in the take it or leave it category. And I remember this back, I wrote a book called, I wrote a book, uh, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago, 18 years ago, right after The Apprentice. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't put that in the bio because I didn't know if you were bragging about that still. So, but I love that you dropped that little tidbit in there. So now people are going to go fire up the Google the Google search engine. So it, it's awesome, man. It's like yeah, an old the, man well, saying Google was, search engine. I was engine. embarrassed about it because it was a. You know, it's like I, I. It's like oh yeah, I was on. Weren't you on The Bachelor? <laughs> you know, I was. I was, I was on Survivor, guys. Yeah, I was that's, actually that's, on The Bachelorette, true. is what I tell people. <laughs> So in the be- for the first for the first five years, I was kind of embarrassed. Like, oh, I don't want to know anybody to really know I was on a I was on a reality television show. That's almost embarrassing, particularly today, right? Right, right, right. right. It's like, oh, you're on a you're on a reality TV show. But um, then, as I got, I don't know, as I kind of came to, ter- to came to terms with. But meanwhile, I think like 16 million people. I was like, I don't want anybody to know. Well, 16 million people every Thursday watch that show. This is right. some folks are going to know about it. In- in the heyday. So, but now I feel fine about it. I, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it was a fun life experience and it, I did it and it was great. But, um, I think my point here is that I don't know what my point You said was. you wrote a book 18 years ago, right oh, yeah. after the apprentice. So, so I wrote, this, wrote this is why Bo is very pre- useful, by the way. <laughs> keep, keep going. Sorry. In addition Sorry, to many other things. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Was, uh, there's a, there's a Gartner group study that I remember in starting from scratch. One of the, the fundamental pieces of this was, about it was a book about entrepreneurship starting with with not without a lot of money mm-hmm. how how do you get that how does that how do Americans accomplish that and one of the things that I've remembered from that book and I still think about it all the time it comes up all the time is that that Gartner group study from almost 20 years ago that said one in five people are fully engaged love 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 their work that's that's Brian and Bo Three out of five are just kind of take it or leave it, and they do it just because they have to, and they're just uh-huh. doing it to make a living. And then one out of five, 
they they actually hate their work so much they're trying to bring their company down. Oh, they're oh. like a, they're actually a net net negative to their employer because of how much disdain they have for their for their work. They're actively trying to bring their employer down. They want wow. their boss to get fired. They'd like to see their company not do well. That's how much. So we got to. The reality of America is that you know only one in five people are fortunate enough, and I think we're luckily in this category that we really do love what we mm-hmm. do. So I could count it, uh, Brian. I'll give you. I'm going to give you one and a half core pursuits on all. Of it. <laughs> You know, one one of the things I'm curious about is as was as I was going through the book, it seems like relationships is something like you kept coming back to, whether it be mm-hmm. uh, relationships in a marital, uh, significant other, spousal sort of way, uh, relationships with children, this like social community epicenter thing. Talk a little bit about some of your findings there. Like it, it just seems like that was a very big piece of it that was riddled all throughout what these happy retirees were saying was present in a happy retirement. Yeah. So again, a lot of this just comes from, you ask dozens and dozens and dozens of questions and some things just come back kind of without anything really definitive. And then some of the categories come back with some pretty stark findings, if you Mm -hmm. will. And and again, when when you go into doing this research and these question, these surveys, if you will, you don't really know what's going to come back with, with, with data that, that says something that you can learn from. And one of the things that I wanted to understand this relationship between uh, retirees and then their adult children. Mm-hmm. And I'm, 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 and I've always read that we, there's this big percentage of Americans that are still supporting their adult children. Mm-hmm. H- kind of hard for me to, I guess I'd see that to some extent in, in my client base. Sure. And you say, well, so-and-so is 35. Oh, we're still paying for their, my grandkids school. Mm-hmm. Oh, we actually help them with our mortgage. So I hear about this, but it's also something that people don't love to talk about. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, you don't want to say that sure. you're paying the mortgage for your 40 year old. Right, 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 right. Yeah. But in the survey, I did get back that, uh, almost 50% of retirees in the unhappy, or l- l- let me restart this guys. Um, what I found when it comes to support of adult children, there's a statistically significant difference in happy the happy retirees spend less per month on their adult kids mm-hmm. than the unhappy group. Got it. Which is very interesting. Was was, was kind of eye opening to me is that it's what does that go back to? It goes back to independence. We, mm-hmm. it is, we independent children make for a happy retiree. What was also interesting that. You don't want your kids to be live. So you want to be close to your kids. The other thing I asked is that how many kids do you have? How close do you live to your children? Are you within driving distance? Is Are they close by? And one thing that I learned from the data was that happy retirees have a propensity to live near or close by to a higher percentage of their children. Hmm. So of their adult kids, if you have four kids and uh, one of them lives nearby in Atlanta, and the other three are in Connecticut, uh, Minnesota, and LA. Then that's that that's a, could be a real problem. It's hard. Yeah, the, yeah. the closer thing, yeah. we get to our kids, with let's say three of our four kids live all within the Atlanta metro. Again, from the research that I, I that I've uh, deciphered, our happiness levels skyrocket. Mm. And we have a much higher probability. And again, not, oh, these are all just ingredients. So this sure, is one sure. of thirty. Sure, things. sure, sure, sure. But there's this higher probability that we'll end up in, with a happy in our happy retirement state if we're close to a higher percentage, more fifty percent or more of our adult kids. I, I thought it was interesting, Wes, that you may, did make the point though, because I, I, I think. All of us, I, I, we talk about constantly on the shows that we want people building memories mm-hmm. over buying things. And I did like that you differentiated when you were going through this that if you're if you're saving up to take your your kids and grandkids on that cruise or that big vacation or other things, that doesn't count against this. Uh, you know, essentially economic outpatient care. If I'm you, you know, borrowing a millionaire next door concept. And you also, I like that you you put a threshold that because I think because we do when we go give presentations, I think about that engineer group that we talked to, Bo, yep. and there was um, one of the, the engineers raised her hand and she says, "Hey, I think it's kind of cruel to not." 
help my kids a little bit, and we have to make sure we we soften mm-hmm. to to explain that we're not saying, hey, this is like a pack of wolves that you feed them, you know, you, you get them to a certain size and then throw them out the door, and then you don't give them anymore. What Wes's point that I love that he differentiated, you actually put a threshold of what the amount was kind of in the book, so that if you are doing small incidental gifts, mm-hmm. other things like that, or, or, or taking them on a trip every year, that that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the bigger things, just like Wes referenced, where you're paying their mortgage. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so I don't know if you want to share that, that threshold you found in your research, Wes, but I thought that that was a great point that you actually had a differentiator between incidentals or, or what I would call healthy gifting versus hey, maybe stuff. maybe you are a crutch to to your children's independence. Yeah, so I I did ask this question of I wanted to, to nail this down. So when I asked this question, I, I called it residual financial support, meaning that you're spending helping your kids, your adult children, you're helping their to sustain some area of their lifestyle. Mm-hmm. It, which which I said does which does not mean a trip to Disney. Right? Sure. It doesn't mean <clears throat> gifts at Christmas. This means that you're paying for these 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 lifestyle. Uh, uh, these lifestyle areas and happy retirees spend on average less than 500 bucks a month on their adult kids. Mm. The, the unhappy group actually spends over $700 a month. Oh, yeah. wow. So it is, there is a real difference between the two. The unhappy group tends to just, again, there, there's a million different ways to describe this. And this is why I like to just kind of go back to the data and just, well, this is what the data says. And none of these are black and white. So even in this scenario here, I think what a retiree can learn from this, and again, somebody who's 30, 40, as you're, as you're raising your kids, well, we clearly want independent children. And it doesn't mean we're not going to help our adult children. It just means that the, the less we need to be supporting them and the less that we allow them to rely on us as parents financially – the data shows me that it leads to a higher probability of kind of landing in that happy camp. Mm-hmm. What about, so that's talking about like children. What about marriage? What did you find anything as it relates to like, just again, sort of unique findings with either spouses or that type of household structure that was either common or uncommon amongst happy retirees? So one of the, one of the things I, I call this in the book, uh, you, we all get at least we we all get at least one marriage mulligan. Oh Meaning wow! That I okay. I would have thought that <laughs> I don't know divorce if that's a hot take, cold take, <laughs> but that's definitely a take. Keep going. I, I would have thought that, and I think at the time, my own bias was just ha- knowing I, I I had a family member going through divorce. Sure, my mom's yeah. been through some divorces. Yep. Um, and it's, and I just see the pain. It's just tough, right? Mm-hmm. It's really, even mm-hmm. like the, the easiest divorce is still, still hard, like Super wrecks hard. a year of your life, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, some divorces can take, you know, a decade uh, to, to really settle out. So I was thinking that you, there would be a big hit to the propensity to land in the happy camp with, if there's any divorce. Mm-hmm. And what was interesting was there was, there was no diminishment in happiness whatsoever, with 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 a second marriage at all, mm. so those who happen to have been married a second time n- seem seem to have no hit towards happiness. When you get into your third, fourth marriage, etc., I saw happiness levels on average decline pretty significantly. So I interpreted that as look, look one one marriage mulligan. the the um, The second part around this is, and and this is a little hard to describe without the visual. But I wanted to understand kind of the roadmap of marriage and our happiness levels at different stages. Yeah. So first year, second year, fifth year, 10th year, 20, 30. Mm-hmm. And it's it's an interesting continuum where I'm, I'm trying to find years of marriage relative to levels of general happiness. Mm-hmm. And again, you, you take 2,000 families and you essentially, or you econometrically just put overlay all of the dip of the entire body uh, per the, the, the entire body of research per year. And we end, and then relating that back to the financial stages of our lives. So it, and it kind of makes sense where in the beginning, I see this great early stage of happiness. Maybe you call the honeymoon phase, but it also makes sense financially. We have, it's just about, uh, it's just about you and your spouse in the mm-hmm. beginning. Just, yeah. Hey, we got time. We got money. We can do what we want with our money. And then there's this big hit to wham, wait a minute, what do these kids mean? Well, 
now all of a sudden we go from we can do whatever we want with our money to now we got to do all of our money is going to these new humans. Uh huh. And then we go through these machinations of uh, as the kids start to leave the house, we see a big spike in kind of marital angst when it, when we're paying for college. And then we see this reprieve when they get out of college. So it's a really interesting continuum of money, uh, these money phases of marriage and these levels of happiness at different phases of our marital timeline. Mm-hmm. And and that's a, it's kind of one, the, maybe the most fun graph and visual in the book. I, I thought it was interesting, Wes, is that because this would be good for Bo to hear too, because mm-hmm. anybody who's in the messy middle of you've got young children, <laughs> You, your 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 days are long, but you go. You are going to find just like a country song. We'll talk about the years are short. Sure. But you had said, and I have found this because I'm in my forties, that there's a sentimental part or memories blossom. Is that that crazy middle part that you that we're all describing with the young kids, the 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 madness of the schedules, getting them all around town. When you look back on that later, that stuff is like rocket fuel for contentment later in life too because you'll remember those as the the good years mm-hmm. there is a reason mm-hmm. country songs are being written about that and you describe that blossoming moment kind of in the book a little bit because that is the fuel for some of that that future happiness for couples after they get past the the kids graduating from college the the days are long the years are short yeah. what what country music song is that well, I, I don't know if that's... Uh, uh, it I, seems like it would be in one. Look, I don't there, know. We're two, in Nashville. I, don't, I, don't I feel know like... Know the I mean, Darius Rucker has a, uh, one of those look-back songs. I think Trace Atkins has yeah. one of those look-back songs. Um, don't put me... My wife is the lyrics person. I'm just the one that can hum <laughs> the tunes for you. So it's... um, it, But it's definitely... Doesn't it make sense that it's a country song, you know, to think about the blossoming of, of Listen, memories you're preaching and how the good choir. things are? I, I told a story on one of my po- a recent podcasts that uh, we had some fa- little family angst from, and I'm not going to go deep into the story, but this was a, a let's call it a family message that that had a family text message to the to the siblings, if you will, that had this long story of woe, and I'm taking care of you and. Then I've been taking care of them and taking care of everybody, including my exes. And I thought, this is a wonderful country music song. This is a country music classic. <laughs> so my son and I sat down and actually just made a country music song out of this family woe is me text message because it it, it would just it sit, the lyrics set itself up perfectly. Uh, maybe another core pursuit: writing, turning I love family, text turning family messages woes into, <laughs> into country songs. I love yes. it. I think that's genius. So before, because I, 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 I know we want to talk about the things that people are screwing up, mm-hmm. and uh, you know some indicators of that um, to create unhappiness. But before we leave relationships, I want to leave a teaser that single handedly would probably sell you some books. Wes is that you. In the book, talk about how often married couples get frisky. Yeah, you you to, broke to it down. To create happiness. Now, yeah, I you don't put know. The that, you know, this is a family show, so I don't know if you need to get into. <laughs> as you said, I got nervous earlier when you said, "Hey, I need to paint a picture <laughs> of this next thing I'm talking about." I was like, "Where is he going to go with this?" But it is Wes somehow asked the question of these participants of his research. How often them and their spouses are getting together? Spent some intimate time as together. A, um, you know, as, 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 as you know, yeah, the, intimate is probably Brian, risky. What are you trying to say? What are you getting at? What are you getting at? Well, I, I have no idea what you're saying. Well, yeah, tell okay, me I'm going to turn red. But just know, in, in Wes's book, because I'm probably the, mo- the biggest prude here on the stage. So, you know. <laughs> I'll lead to it. I love it. I love it. So it's that funny, is in I've the book, given- though. Uh, what you're asking about is uh, uh, one way to couch this conversation is um, I think you're you're referring to intimacy. Yep. There we go. You, you use that word too. I mean, that's, that's, such what, a, that's such to, a fancy I word. To, I tried for, to lay it up for you. Yeah, it is. It, what, what you guys are asking is um, how often do happy retirees have sex? Sure. And um, it, again, it's not. It's actually not something I wanted to even ask, and I didn't really even want to write about it. But I will say that our team here kind of was pretty adamant to say, look, let's, let's get some data around this. And and I was, I, I, and, and we've even had my, my producer on retire sooner podcast has ske- wanted to schedule um, a sex therapist. It was a, she was a, uh, I, I'm not going to go into the details, but I was like, look, that's just a bridge too far for me. <laughs> I, 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 
It's a bridge too far to talk about retiree sex for 45 minutes. I just can't do it. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do it. But, it, but um, what you would say is if someone is interested in knowing the answer, knowing the magic number, it's in the book. Yeah. It's in there. It, it is in the book. And I think I'll, I'll just say that I'm blushing and I don't want to go into it. And you can just read it in the book. I love it. So uh, I, I have a question. So one of the things that we we talked, you know, I I, uh, I like to like do a healthy lifestyle, right? Like I like to try to like exercise and that kind of stuff. It's really hard for me to think about things I know that I'm supposed to do. Like I know I'm supposed to like counting macros, like that whole thing. It's much easier for me to think about things not to do. Hey, don't drink this much. Don't eat super sugar. I like my lists of like don't do's. And what I thought was great is as you're going through through here, you called them the uh, the you robs, right? The unhappy folks. Uh, is that is that? It sounds that right? cooler when Wes says it. It sounds a lot sound cooler when you say it. Are there some things that you found that were like, hey, here here are some things that they do that you should probably like notate. Like maybe I maybe maybe I avoid this this type of behavior, this type of consumption, this type of fill in the blank. That would just would be valuable again for for folks sort of in the stage that I'm in to think about. I, okay, I want to keep an eye on. Maybe these aren't the things I should pursue that are going to lead to ultimately a happy retirement. So, so again, I, I think of it as we've got these 30 ingredients of the stew, and, and you don't have to do or nail all of them. But if you're doing any – if you're, if you're not following any of them – the, the more of them you're not following, the higher the propensity is to land in the unhappy camp. And by, but by the way, it, the, um, where you, Rob, and H. Rob came from it, is um, the original book title of what I wanted to write 10 plus years ago when I wrote You Can Retire Sooner Than You Think was, was inspired by the book Happiest Baby on the Block. Okay. And I was an early parent. I, I my now 14 year old was, I guess, you know, three, four. And there was a kind of a popular book. Mm -hmm. Oh, have you read happy baby on the block? Oh yeah. Still is. These are all the things that you should be doing with your baby to make them happy, um, to make your life easier as a parent. And I think that was one of many inspirations that said it was kind of ding. I remember like shaving in the morning and it was like, ding, happiest retirees on the block. That's a book I've always wanted to write. Love it. And my and I submitted my first book with that title, and it got uh, rejected. <laughs> and then when I finished the, <laughs> and and then and then I, I ended up writing the book. That was the working title. And I thought, I'll, I'll just push this through. I'll make. Um, it's my book. I'm mm -hmm. gonna make. This is what I'm gonna call it. And they just. I did. I lost the battle, and it never. It never became part of the first book. The second book. I said, well, now I'm an established author. I've sold books. I can name this thing whatever the hell I want to name it. Right. It's going to be called a happy retire on the block. Again, it was rejected. <laughs> so, <laughs> so instead, I use these two camps is I describe, oh, who's you, the, the phrase richest guy on the block, happiest mm -hmm. baby on sure. the block. Who's the happiest retiree on the block? Love it. Who's the who's the guy? That means like, hey, who do we all know is the guy that we kind of want to be like? Who's That's the, the way to show them, Wes. You got them, man. Way, to, way to drop it in there on behind it. the scenes. They they'll never you know got it right <laughs> past them. So anyway, so it's the, so what 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 does the unhappy camp do? Again, I think they they fall short. Uh, they fall short on a lot of these categories. Mm -hmm. They fall short maybe on the money category, and they they carry a big mortgage uh, into retirement. They fall short on um, th with their family, so they mm -hmm. they end up the relationship with their kids may not be great. They don't have independent kids, and the kids are all spread out over the country. That's a that's a that's a real that's a tough one, and and that's a real happy retiree. Uh, that's a happy retiree killer, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, lack of core pursuits, huge one, right? If you if and this probably is the biggest one, Bo. If I had to say, where do you mess this up? And again, you guys love your work, but I see that the biggest culprit is too much work, not enough play. Mm. And it's so easy for us to fall into that trap. Anybody sure. that loves their work or feel it's maybe not that maybe it's not the love camp. It's the people that feel as though they've never, they never have given themselves the permission to, to not work. And it's this thought of, well, work is the most important thing. I've, uh, I'm pretty productive. And I, I, I'm constantly fighting this internal battle personally. I got all these kids and they want to do all these things and school's expensive. And I want to have, you know, I want to set a good example. I want to live the, I, I, I would do a, a podcast. What that, uh, 
um, retire sooner. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, this is this is the world that I live in, and I need to live this. And it's a lot e it's a lot easier financially, which is the fundamental foundation of of, of a lot of this, to just keep working. And I, you see entrepreneurs all the time, or doctors, all the professionals that feel as though it's okay. It's almost they have too much guilt to do anything else but to work. not work. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I mean, I think this, that like, is a, a a struggle, and and a lot of this comes back to. I feel like, because in a minute, I'm going to ask you, is there some like personal display things that mm. you see with unhappy? Like consumption but, behavior type consumption stuff? Consumption behavior. But Wes, what you describe a lot of times, it comes back to is, I don't think people know their why. They don't know really what makes them happy. So they're just out there throwing hooks left and right, hoping that this next thing is going to bring them the, the happiness for that emptiness that they might feel. But they really haven't done the homework to actually fill that hole with something that's fulfilling. Because that's the problem. Anytime we talk about happiness, it seems like everybody wants to make it super simple. But I think the biggest part is just purpose. Mm -hmm. You have to feel like when you wake up in the morning that you're doing something that feels deliberate, that's um, you know giving you... Uh, you know, deeper than you. And that's why you talk about church. That's why you talk about relationships. That's why you talk about legacy with kids. All that stuff is much deeper than, um, hey, uh, let's just go buy a BMW, mm -hmm. you know, using some of Wes's research. You know, all, we, we, we all know, I think we've, many of us have heard that our, our, on our deathbeds, uh, one of the biggest regrets that, that comes up over and over again is lack of rela relationships. Mm-hmm lack of the the commitment and time to relationships and it's really easy for a lot of people to do right it's 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 almost we feel this in, in varying level some people have no guilt whatsoever some people have a little bit of guilt oh well if i'm out playing golf and i'm hanging out with i'm socializing and spending time socializing i'm not working i'm not spending time with my family and right. friends or my, my with my kids mm -hmm. But I look at it the other way, and this is maybe this is part of the reason I write these books, and I do my, my a podcast about, and I interview people around these relationship topics. Is that I think it's something I've always struggled with because it'd be very easy for me to always be working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And uh, and I look at the almost form formulaically is to say I have to carve out time. It's not a maybe nice to have. It's a it's a must to say that I'm going to spend time that is social connected time, whether you're part of a social epicenter, which just means any sure. organized group. Actually, the, one of the questions I asked, happy retirees to have at least one social epicenter. And that could be your church. It mm -hmm. could be your golf group, your tennis group. It doesn't matter what it is, but you have one social epicenter that can then cultivate more social, more social connectedness. And it really helps when you stop working because all of our work is a social place. Yeah. And, again, even in the work from home world that we live in today, we connect, even though they may not be our first choice, our number one people in our lives, our, who we work with, they become our family our in some respect. Family, yeah. When you leave that, it's really hard to replace it. So you got to have your own social epicenter, particularly as you're moving away from a working world. So if I'm hearing you, if I'm hearing you say this right, you're saying it's actually advised to like be purposeful and intentional in in actually like scheduling time for those. Because I know we struggle with that all the time mm -hmm. about saying, "Oh, we're too busy. We're we're learning how to say no better. We're learning how to turn things away better." You're saying, "Well, you need to pick one or two things or a handful of things to purposefully say yes to to force you to not get lost in the track of working all the time." Am I hearing that thousand correctly? Thousand percent. Okay. Oh, a thousand percent is that it's part. It's just as important as saving money, mm. right? It's like, oh, well, you have to save money. Mm -hmm. Have to do four hundred one k. Well, no, you also have to. And again, this is what my research has taught me. You have to, if you want to end up in the happy retiree camp, have spend time intentionally uh, for socialization, social connectedness, et cetera. It. Doesn't matter what it is, but it's it is part of your week every single week of your life. I yeah, and I, and I, th I think the, the the closing point I would have on that is that we see so many in our practice. You see people who their work is something that gives them a lot of value. They retire, they kind of get bored, 
they head right back they go, to retirement do, or yep, do something go do else. Go work again. Um, so I, I think that I think what what Wes is kind of alluding to, and I also remember Fritz from Retirement Manifesto. He he talks about this quite a bit too. Be deliberate on those hobbies, mm-hmm. passions, and those things, so that when you do cross that threshold of living off of your your savings, you, you know, and all the things that you've worked for years to build that you will still wake up in the morning feeling like, hey, there is something to do that makes me happy, mm-hmm. brings me purpose. And that, because I think that is the sad thing. A lot of people who put, like, I would need $3 million once I cross that threshold, hot diggity dog, mm-hmm. I'm officially out of the workforce. If you have that number, but without the ingredients, the purpose, um, y- y- it's going to fall flat. There's a good chance it's not going to work. Right. I love that word deliberate. I, and I don't. I didn't really. I don't think I used that in the book. Delivered. I, I use the the terminology of give yourself permission mm, that yeah. it's okay. But I like your word too. It's deliberate. It, it is. It should be part of the plan. It's not a, just a reward. Oh, I've really worked hard. Now I can socialize. I think it's the wrong way to look at it. Mm-hmm. Is that it is a must. It's a. It's a. Give yourself permission that it is something. It is part of the of the larger balanced picture. Um. Closing out, though, I did want to give some things because people love this meaty type of stuff, and you put it in the book, so it's crazy for us not to, sure. to, to use your research. Um, and I would love to give you, after I throw a few of these things out, just give us some thoughts on it. I thought it was interesting that because we all know Millionaire Next Door became famous because it talked about how many millionaires drove F-150s. Sure, yeah. I thought it was a, a really cool take that you had the exact opposite. The people who are the most unhappy in retirement are those driving BMWs. Mm. So that's one point. And then I Number thought it was Number one luxury inter- car, yep. Number that, one luxury car of the unhappy retiree. And, and then I thought it was interesting <laughs> because, and, and you actually, because we're going through high inflation sure. right now, you talked about that. Like at the beginning of your research, I think the typical housing price of a happy retiree or that threshold was like in the mid 300s. But now we're over half a million dollars. So it's amazing how these things are evolving in real time. But you did have some some consumption things built into your 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 factors or indicators of what can create happiness versus unhappiness. Share a little bit about that. Yeah, so one of the things that I, I, I think of is when I think of the spending profile of the happy retiree is the they're they're masters of the middle. Mm-hmm. So that they don't necessarily demand five star and they don't demand first class, but they also they, they also don't want to be, you know, in, in the back of the bus. Sure. Right. Yeah, or, yeah. Or, or maybe that's the wrong word. They don't want to they don't want to travel. Um, on on a shoestring, they don't budget. want to be in a hostel. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, sharing a bathroom with hostel. sixteen other people. They don't people. want to be on a. <laughs> you know, they don't want to be on a tour bus. And I think of these movies where you get this awful tour bus with, you know, t- crates of goats and chickens on the tour bus. Yeah, right? yeah we don't yeah, want yeah. that either. Right. But uh, we happy retirees don't also don't fly around in G fives. Sure. So it's some it's some sort of there's some. Um, balance between when when it comes to consumption. So I call so a lot of happy retirees are what I call masters of the middle. Okay. Um but the other way, way the, the other thought of this and this kind of goes back to financial planning is that how do you how do you do guilt-free spending and as opposed to and, and one thing that I've always uh, it's 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 a complicated topic that I'm sure you guys have thought about is that we tend to be maybe particular or particularly in America we tend to be kind of judgy on how we spend our money, mm-hmm. right? So we, and I think of my own, my own dad, who's kind of like, uh, he looks at somebody with a nice car and he says, I can't believe, or a boat. Yeah, I can't yeah, yeah. believe they would spend $200,000 mm-hmm. on a boat. You know, they're so frivolous. But the guy with the boat would look at my dad and say, I can't believe this guy spends 150 grand a year on his horses. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So for him, it's like, well, I had to live on a farm. I'm just an old school guy. But you do spend a lot of money on those horses. <laughs> right? It's so true. It's so true. Right? So we kind of get judgy. It's like <laughs> Americans are like, well, what I'm spending my money on is fine. No, I, don't, I don't need a lot of nice stuff. Um, so I, I try to take the total judgment of anything totally out of the equation. Like I love, I want you to have a boat and I want you to have horses and I want you to have a, I don't care if you have a net jets card, God bless you. But as long as you follow the, 
And by the way, I would have come to Nashville if you would have sent me the Money Guys jet. We were going to send the jet to get you. Uh, it was, it was, there's a thing at the shop. It's, it's a fun thing. We'll tell you later. <laughs> get a tune up. Um, that's right. That's right. <laughs> next time, I'll New just go to PDK and we'll I'll thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Yeah, I'd love you to, to hop around in the jet. But the, I think of it this way is as long as I spent a lot of time talking about the 4% rule, mm-hmm. 4% plus. Yeah. Rule, yeah, sure. Which is just look, if you can understand what you're allowed to spend from your assets, which is this four percent plus rule, four percent it's it's four percent and a little bit, call it between four four to four and a half, plus inflation every year, as long as you have a certain percentage in equities, then it doesn't matter what you're spending the money mm-hmm. on. Because you know fundamentally the happy retiree just says, All right, I know what I can spend. Here's what I have. I, I know it's gonna produce I can take this much out every year, follow the four and a half percent rule. And then spend it on whatever you want, mm-hmm. uh, and I and I and I'm, I'm kind of the opposite of judgy with money. I try to be. I want I want to encourage people to spend money on whatever they want to spend it on, as long as they're following that four and a half percent rule. I love it. Well, let me ask you this, Wes. What would be so if you if you're going to give like from all your research, all the stuff that you put together to prepare this book, and you're going to say, hey, here, you know, no matter. Where the person is, whether it's a retiree or it's someone approaching retirement, or maybe it's a young person sort of in the thick of their career, are there like three, I'd say like, hey, here are three things. Here are three actionable things today Mm -hmm. that you should be thinking about or ruminating on that will have a high likelihood of putting you in the place to one day be a happy retiree or to today be a happy retiree. What would those three things be? Like I would prioritize, you know, these, these three. Um, that's, it's a good question. Nobody's ever asked me that, Bo. Uh, so simple, easy, impactful. I would say, uh, that what you could do today that, that moves the meter, p- plan a trip with a friend. Ooh. Okay. Oh, wow. That, 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 that's a little a contrary friend. to what, what I would have thought. Yeah. Look at both. I'm literally, I'm literally writing it down. <laughs> I mean, I, this was a plan self-serving a trip question. With a friend. Plan, a, plan a trip with a group of friends, whether it's you and your spouse and, and other, uh, other couples, whether it's you and just your friends. It's, it's, it's a big deal to be able to do this, by the way. I've got yeah. a trip coming up in uh, May. That is a is a one of these COVID 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 reschedule reschedule reschedule. Mm-hmm. It's like now it's been this is not like in the third year. Second, sure. it'll be of it'll be have been two and a half years after mm-hmm. we originally planned it, and it's a big deal. Like to go away for four days as a dad with four kids, mm-hmm. like it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. but and I and honestly, I feel a little guilty about it. You won't but after you're it, on day one, though, on that trip. <laughs> Once you get the kids out, there, you'll be, you'll have it. Get the the umbrella and the drink. You're gonna be like, this is all right. <laughs> Keep so going. So glad we did this. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, plan a trip with a friend. Okay. Uh, and give, give your so give yourself permission that this is not this great luxury. This is an essential in life, and it's it's one of the things I learned in this social chapter that happy retirees do tend to travel more with friends. That's actually a very interesting graph in the book. That's a, that's a great um, point. Number two, I don't know, join, join, similar in the social vein, join a group, Mm. right? Join a, I was talking to a retiree the other day. She's just about to retire and she's down in, it's not the villages, but it's one of these places kind of like the villages down in in Florida where it's like, there's like a hundred different groups, Mm -hmm. right? Everybody's in like seven groups. And she was like, I just don't really like groups. My husband, Bob loves groups. He's in like the water polo group, sure, the bad golfer group. (laughs) Macarena <laughs> or the, the karaoke group. The she goes, I don't really like group. Groups. I want to be in that group, the Macarena group. And she goes, maybe I'll start a group of people that don't like to be in groups. <laughs> you like, know what? Right. I'm sure there's a group of people that would do that. That's great. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's church. I don't. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, pick up a new something. Like uh, I, uh, one of my favorite interviews I did on Retire Sooner was a guy named uh, Tom Vanderbilt. Mallory, is that correct? Beginners. He wrote a book called Beginners. Okay. okay. And it was essentially saying you can begin anything at any time. Like we we think like, oh, you're I'm 45. I can't start something new now. Mm. I'm not going to start snowboarding now. I've had well, that's thought. wrong. You should <laughs> if you don't now. Um, so anyway, th- so those are all couples, I think, easy things to do. Start something it. brand new. I love you know, I, I just learned great. to play guitar like two years ago. I'd never played guitar. Um and I just learned to play guitar a couple years ago. Um, so these are things that we can all do later in life. And then I'd say 
Billboard, maybe more of one. The, the obvious one is that check in on the fundamental financial checkpoints mm. you got to get to, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah, I know this is, we, we always talk about money and we spend a lot of time here on the, on the let's say the, the softer side of happy retirement, but we do, we do need to have the, the fundamentals financially, right? So we got to mm-hmm. get to the 500,000 on check mark. We got to figure out a, a, the time we're going to pay off our mortgage. We got to have multiple income streams and just get intentional around that. And a little bit of planning as you guys know so well, uh, a with with the money guys show and the firm that you guys run and own, um, it doesn't take a ton of planning to go a long way. It's just right. an ounce of planning gives you the gives you mile gives you miles worth of peace of mind to get to these checkpoints. That's great. Well, Wes, I, I appreciate your time today. You, yeah. You've been tremendous. <laughs> I, I, I want to hold it up so everybody can see it. You know, Wes has just written what the happiest retirees know. If you want to know how often. You and your spouse should be intimate, what type of car you drive, what type of alcohol that successful people use. This is the book for you. But Wes, we've had a blast, man. Thanks so much. And I, I look forward to, you know, hopefully breaking some bread next time we're also at a conference together because you, you're, you're, we always have the best of times when we're hanging out. So, And I'd love to invite you up here to Nashville to see the new studio, the new building, and um, get you in here for that as well. Can't wait to see it, guys. Uh, if we don't go to Austin, out out in the town, we'll go out of the town in Nashville. I think Love there's it. some fun things to do up there, right? There's, there's one or two. There's one or two things to keep us occupied for sure. Yeah, I mean, anybody who moves to Nashville, you know that after the first year, you cut off the Airbnb that your house becomes. <laughs> so it's it is one of those things. Broadway is a very popular destination for for people who come to visit. Awesome. Well, God bless you guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Wes. Well, guys. We enjoyed it. I'm your host, Brian Preston. Mr. Bo Hansen, Money Guy Team, out.